Hello board game brothers and sisters, I'm Adam Singer and welcome to another episode where I'll be letting you know of Kickstarter's launching this week. We are getting near the end of the month so as usual make sure to head over to the Board Game Co channel because Alex puts out a video at the end of every month going over all the campaigns launching over the next 30 days. He also has a ton of other really awesome content as well that you'll definitely want to check out. Also make sure to check out our Discord which I'll leave a link to in the description below and I'm pretty sure this is just the best place on the internet if you want to see all the campaigns that we know about that are coming up in the future. And we have everything nice grouped by release date so you can go ahead and check out everything launching this week everything launching next week and so on and so forth and we also have all the different links that might be interesting to find out more info about those games and of course there's always discussion going on so you can go ahead and chat with everyone else and share any info that you find and the publishers often hang around their channels as well and if you are a publisher i offer this coverage all for free and i'll have a link in the description below link into a form where you can submit your game and i'll automatically create a channel for you on the discord as well but i think that's enough for an intro so let's check out the kickstarters and the first campaign we have launches on august 23rd and it's called the age of trains and this plays two to four players and takes about 60 to 90 minutes to play and in this game, players are going to be choosing a map. The maps all represent different countries with real locations. And they also determine the player count and the number of rounds that are going to be played per game. And players are going to be navigating their own trains on the map, upgrading the train in different ways by using worker placement. And then you're going to be picking up and delivering different types of cargo to different areas on the map for victory points. This game also incorporates stock holdings, so you'll be able to buy stocks in different locations on the map in order to invest in those hubs. There's also a main game board that's going to be used to determine the actions available to the players and it's also going to monitor the player's development over the course of the game. There's also a personal player board that monitors the individual player's progress and improvements that they make to their train. And there's four categories of upgrades to their train. There's the engine, there's the hopper wagon, and then there's also additional wagons that can be added to your train as well as specialists. And these are all going to improve your efficiency in some way, except for the special cards, which are going to allow you to break some of the rules of the game to perform some special abilities. And now getting into games launching on August 24th, we have Black Rose Wars Rebirth. And this plays two to four players and takes about 90 minutes to play. And this one really misled me. I thought it was going to be a reprint, judging by the name. Usually you have words like rebirth or re-something if you're doing a reprint. But this is actually a brand new standalone game that you can actually consider as a second chapter in the Black Rose Wars series. And although this is going to be a different game, there's still going to be a ton of similarities to the original. And the original game was a competitive fantasy game of deck building, strategy, and combat. And this new one's going to be that exact same type of game. And in both these games, players are powerful mages competing to reach the top of their ranks by fighting in hexagonal rooms. But in the original, you're destroying those rooms. Well, in this new one, you're actually going to be fighting in those ruins while trying to rebuild and reestablish those rooms that were previously destroyed. And this one's going to be our pick of the week. And it's not surprising as the original game has had some really nice reviews and a really great rating over on Board Game Geek. And all these tiles start very green and overgrown with vegetation because this game takes place 25 years after the original Black Rose Wars. And players are going to be using six schools of magic to achieve their different goals and each school of magic behaves a little differently. One might help you summon powerful creatures, one might deal direct damage, while another might allow you to enchant and deceive the other players. The game system is divided into a few different phases, but each turn you're going to be gaining a new spell of your choice, and then you're going to be planning your strategy in advance by placing cards face down to reveal later. And you're going to be doing things like attacking other players, solving missions for the Black Rose Order, summoning powerful creatures, or rebuilding those rooms. And just like in the original, if any player is killed, they're reborn immediately, but a little bit of energy is fed to the mage that caused it. There does seem to be a ton more similarities between these games, and there are differences, and I think it really does blur the line between a reprint and a another iteration in the series. But definitely go ahead and check out the OnTable YouTube channel, because Jonah did a really great job going over all the differences between this second chapter and the original game. My personal opinion here is that these games are a little too similar for me to ever want to own both of them. I'd probably just pick the one that I like the most, which would probably be this newer one, because I can only assume that they've streamlined a few things and improved on the initial rule set. And if I already own Black Rose Wars, I'd probably just keep that one, but I'd definitely check out the rule set here to see if there's any takeaways or improvements that I might want to house rule in the original game. I couldn't get an exact answer if the original content would also be offered in this campaign, but it sounded like it wouldn't be. I wouldn't be surprised if they threw in some extra copies in the Pledge Manager afterwards, but if you don't already have this game and you do want to purchase it, I think that this version's probably your safest bet. 
And as always, I have links to all these campaigns in the description below. Also on the 24th, we have The Gardens, and this plays 2-4 to four players and takes about 30-45 to 45 minutes to play. And this is a competitive card drafting and tableau building game where players are going to be building up their own garden in the Royal Botanical Gardens. Players are going to be drafting cards with different features such as flower beds, ponds, fountains, benches, and statues. And these are all going to have different effects and ways to score points. And your tableau is made up of three different rows. The top is the water side, the bottom is the city side, and the middle is the grass. And this is going to put some limitations on where you're able to place your cards. And you're going to be gaining points based on your tableau and the position of the different features. But also on your turn, you're going to be moving around different meeples on your board as they walk through these different paths. And you're also going to be scoring points based on what the visitors see as they walk past those different features. There's also some additional modules that can add more variability and complexity to the game with additional landmarks that gain extra points and abilities to the players. You can also go ahead and check out their website and there is a little typo there, but I think what they're trying to say is that if you sign up to get notified of their campaign, you'll also get entered in a giveaway for a chance to win a pledge. Also on August 24th, we have Super Truffle Pigs, and this plays two to four players and takes about 20 to 30 minutes to play. And at the start of this game, all players are gonna draft three mission cards, and they're gonna be trying to complete those cards in order to gain victory points. On a player's turn, they're gonna be using actions to move across the tiles, dig up different truffles, and try to avoid the wolves. Truffles are used to fulfill the mission cards, but they also come in three different types, each with their own varying difficulty and points that they grant. Players can also discover super truffles, which provide a one-time use super-powered action. At the end of their turn, players are going to program the movements of the wolves by using any number of direction cards, and once all the players have had their turn, the wolves are going to move according to those cards. If a wolf ever enters a card with a pig, then that pig is removed from the game. At that point, the player with the most points wins the game. Also on the 24th, we have an upgrade to your Calyx shelves, and this is called the Lox Racks Board Game Shelf Insert. And this is going to allow you to store all your games individually and horizontally on their own shelves. And this is going to make it really easy to get all your games from the bottom or middle of the shelf if you like to store your games horizontally. And it's also completely adjustable, so you can put any number of shelves within a Calyx cube at any distance that you want away from each other. And they do have this neat little video here showing you exactly how the system works. You're going to be sticking these little squares onto the side of your shelf, and then it uses bars in order to support your games to create those individual shelves. These little notches here in these squares are just used for measurement, so it gives you a few different options for how much distance you want between your game and the next shelf. And then you just go ahead and put those wherever you want. And they also do give you a couple other different options. One of them is these clear shelves to just display whatever you want. And then it's not shown in this video, but it sounds like they're also going to be including small game drawers for any smaller games that you just want to put in a drawer on your shelf. And I can only assume that those will be similar to my Boxstone shelf because this is actually coming from the same creator. And game storage is pretty important to me and I really like anything that I own to be clean and organized especially when they make it really easy for me to keep it clean and organized because I don't always want to put in that extra effort. And it's because of that that this one's going to be my pick of the week, but there's also a few more reasons. So I actually used to own Calyx shelves, but I wanted to store my games horizontally. Obviously I ran into all the same issues that you're going to run into when doing that, like trying to get a game at the bottom of the stack. And also sliding games back and forth can actually damage your boxes over time. To try and remedy this myself, I actually bought a bunch of these Calyx inserts for 25 bucks Canadian, which really adds up when you're trying to do a whole Calyx shelf. But then the next issue I ran into is that all these shelves were too close together, or if I left a shelf out, then the shelves left too much empty space and was just wasting space on my shelf. So what I ended up doing is drilling my own holes into these inserts, but then that wasn't really a great answer as well because it took a lot of time. And then I also had all these extra holes scattered in my shelves that I wasn't using that looked really bad because Ikea doesn't make those holes look good since they're intended to be covered. So I had to go back and then wood fill all those. So after all that time, effort, and materials, it actually ended up costing me quite a bit. And the end product wasn't exactly as good as I would have liked it to be. I ended up just scrapping the whole project because I just didn't have the ambition to do all that when it was costing me so much. I ended up just selling my IKEA shelves in the end and then buying this box thorn shelf because this was actually the more affordable option with all those things considered. And I've said it before, but I'm really happy with that purchase. It works exactly like how I wanted. And it makes me feel good to have a board game shelf that works the way that I want it to and that I enjoy using and looking at. 
The quality and engineering of the shelf is really impressive. So this is a team that does a really good job and takes care in the way that they design their products. So I do think that you can back with confidence knowing that you're gonna get a good product if this is something that you're interested in backing. I know this one isn't a board game, but it just had to get my pick of the week because I don't know what I would have ended up with if this team wasn't creating these shelving solutions like this and creating options that weren't there otherwise. And I know whatever I would have ended up with, I probably wouldn't have been happy with, so I feel really fortunate that this team is doing what they're doing. Also on the 24th, we have Earth Rising, and this plays one to six players and takes about 90 to 120 minutes to play. And this is a cooperative game where players are trying to create a sustainable world within 20 years. And a really neat aspect of this game is that it's based on actual science. So this is based on the donut system, which I had never heard of before, but reading into it, it's actually pretty interesting. And the whole concept here is that there's a bunch of different challenges that we need to adjust if we want to create a sustainable and peaceful world. And there's a minimum threshold that we need to hit in each of those areas. But we also don't want to overdo it because overdoing it can also have problems that are equally damaging to the world or the population. So for example, we'd want everyone to have access to a comfortable amount of fresh water and food. But we don't want to do it in a way that's going to have a large negative impact on our planet because even just growing food can introduce problems like deforestation or different chemicals and pesticides entering our ecosystem and waterways. So players are going to be trying to balance the needs of the people within the limits of the planet. But on top of that, players are also going to be trying to reverse damage that has already been done to the planet. To do this, players are going to take advantage of different character abilities, and every fifth round there's an election where players have the opportunity to change characters and change the abilities that they have. And the whole goal of the game is to work together to try and get these different sections onto the board, and then flipped in the appropriate way so that the entire board is filled with color. And these different sections represent the advancements made in the different areas of concern. But players are going to run into some more challenges along the way because the whole reason that these problems exist in the first place is that we as the people benefit from exploiting the earth in different ways, some more than others. So throughout the game, players are going to be drawing these status quo strike cards, which are representing the counter efforts towards sustainability for those individuals and groups that are benefiting from the exploitation of the earth and trying to put a stop to what you're doing. And a neat aspect with this is that the more progress that you make, the more resistance these status quo strike cards are going to put up against you. And I already think just by creating this game, this team is doing a really nice service to the world. And even just by playing it, even if you don't agree with every single thing in the game, I think there's something to be learned by playing it. And just through reading this page, I saw a few different references. And board games don't need to be 100% accurate all the time. After all, it is just a form of entertainment. But it did seem like they were doing their research and trying to make everything as science-based as possible. But my point is, they're already doing a good thing here, but then they're also taking it the extra mile and donating 50% of all their profits to different ecological organizations. And they're also creating this game with 100% sustainable produced materials. And I don't really talk about it a lot, but I am a person that really appreciates people doing things in a sustainable way and also I'm not really a big fan of waste. That's just one of the reasons why you don't see me backing too many massive games with a billion miniatures because I don't want to have to ship all that extra material. I don't think it adds that much more fun to the game and I don't want to have to pay for that extra shipping, pay for that extra material and eventually it will get thrown out by someone and make it into our ocean or someplace that it probably shouldn't be. And I don't want anyone to feel bad if they do back those types of games. I still do once in a while for the ones that I think I'll really like. But for myself, I feel like a lot of those I won't get the value of based on their cost and the values that I hold. If every publisher tried to be sustainable with their games, I think we'd see a very different landscape on Kickstarter. And I do think it would be an improvement overall and we'd probably have slightly better games because if board games were on that donut diagram, I think a lot of them would fall into that overdoing okay. it category. Also on the 24th, we have Backyard Chickens, and this plays 2-5 to five players and takes about 30-60 to 60 minutes to play. And this is a deck building game where players are competing to raise the best flock of chickens. You're going to start the game with a basic set of cards, and then you're going to be adding and subtracting cards from your deck as you play in order to customize your deck to best meet the needs of your chickens. During your turn, you're going to be collecting eggs, purchasing supplies, and taking care of your chickens. If you fail to feed or water your chickens, or if they get unhappy for any reason, they're going to produce fewer eggs and they're going to be worth fewer victory points. 
If this continues, they can even potentially run away. When a chicken gets happy or unhappy, you rotate their card to the associated side, and that's going to tell you how much victory points they're worth and how many eggs that they produce. Players are going to continue doing this, building up their little chicken farm, and the game ends when a player reaches 10 or more points. At the end of that round, the player with the most points wins the game. Also on August 24th, we have Shazan Azadi, and this plays 3-5 to five players and takes about 90 to 120 minutes to play. And this is a semi-cooperative expansion to the political strategy game known as Shazim, but the game can also be played as a standalone game as well. In the original game, players are politicians and they're trying to emerge as the new leader of a country. Players are going to draw a card to make a decision on a political issue, and depending on the decision they make, it's going to attribute to their ideology. This is going to happen throughout the game as players build out their ideology more and more, mixing different methodologies and values to form the ideology that will best suit them. These decisions will also dictate what sort of resources you're going to be gathering, and there's four types of resources in the game. There's funds, media, trust, and clout. And these are all going to be used to gain different votes or political powers. And the votes come into play with these different voter pegs that players are going to earn and place on the board. And there's a bunch of different districts on the board, and the goal is to have the majority of voter pegs in a given district. When all majorities have been met in every district, the player with the most majority wins the game. This expansion is going to add a whole new layer to the game because players are not only trying to become the new leader, but they're also revolutionaries attempting to free their country of tyranny. And this is where that semi-cooperative aspect comes into play because all players have a common enemy of that current tyrannical leader. And of course, as the players grow stronger, so will their opposition. And it is possible, if that revolution is not met, that all players will lose the game. And if you missed out on the original campaign, this one will be offering all the original content and Kickstarter exclusives. So definitely check it out if this one sounds interesting to you. Also on August 24th, we have Starship Shuffle, and this plays 1-5 to five players and takes about 20-40 to 40 minutes to play. And this game is inspired by SpaceX and the building, launching, and recovering of rockets. The game starts with a build phase where each player is dealt a starting hand of rocket cards that will be kept facing away from them. And on your turn, you can either play one of the unseen cards trying to match it with the Starship's blueprints, or you can give a hint to a fellow teammate. Successfully playing a rocket card rewards players with development cards, which can be used to increase the rocket's chance of a successful launch. And if the players are able to build the rocket ship in time, then they move on to the launch phase. The launch has a few different stages that must be passed, and to pass each one, players must randomly draw from a special hand of cards that was determined by the development cards that you earned earlier. And the game is won if players successfully launch and land their rocket during the launch phase. If the rocket explodes or the players did not make it to the launch phase, then they all lose the game. Also on August 24th, we have Picaresque Roman, a Requiem for Rogues. And this is a rules light narrative driven tabletop RPG from a Japanese design studio that created the original Picaresque Roman, which I'm probably saying wrong. This game's played with four or five people as well as a game master, and each person's gonna make their own character like in typical RPG fashion. But where this game differs from your typical RPG is that each player is actually competing with each other as well as the GM to earn the highest amount of influence points at the end of the game. The GM is going to be controlling a few different NPC characters as well as a VIP character which is often the focal point of the game. All the other players are going to be trying to discover secret info that gives them a leg up on the other players as well as making deals or even stealing from the other players or NPCs. Players are going to be earning or stealing more and more influence as the story progresses, but players will have to be careful because one player may be acting as a pawn for the VIP and will have a unique way to steal all your hard-earned influence. And then on the 28th, we have the party card game called Toxic People, and this plays 2-6 to six players and takes about 30-60 to 60 minutes to play. And this is a game of office politics where players are going to be trying to form different poker hands in order to form the best hands. The cards don't actually have numbers, so you can only create a subset of poker hands like four of a kind, two of a kind, three of a kind, full house, and five of a kind. Players will all be able to discard and redraw some cards in order to try and form a better hand, and there's also some special action cards that can have different effects on the game that can either help you out or harm your opponents. But keeping these cards does come with a risk because they do occupy a spot in your hand, reducing the total amount of cards that you have for creating different pairs. Whichever player has the worst hand gains a toxic token, and if a player receives three of those, then they are removed from the game. And then of course the last player standing wins the game. And 
that's it for this week, but don't leave yet because we have a couple awesome giveaways to announce. And the first one is going to be for Wild Serengeti. And in this game, players are all competing to create the best wildlife documentary. And on a player's turn, they're going to be placing their camera meeple in order to perform different actions like placing an animal on the board or moving existing animals to different locations on the board. And players are going to be trying to arrange the wildlife in different patterns in different locations on the board in order to complete these scene cards and gain victory points and special tokens and resources. These different resources will allow players to perform additional movements or to ignore the location requirements of their other scene cards. The rounds are tracked on this 3D board and different rounds are going to offer different scoring opportunities and the player with the most points at the end of the game wins the game. And this giveaway is going to be for the Wild Serengeti Pledge which comes with the core game and all unlocked stretch goals. And to enter this giveaway just leave a comment down below with the hashtag wild and I want to know what your spirit animal is. For whatever reason I've always liked wolves so that's definitely my spirit animal but lately I feel more like a hermit crab. And the next giveaway we have is actually for three games because this one's for the Reiner Knizia's Criminal Capers Collection. And these are going to be three 20 minute games that each focus on their own set of mechanisms. The first one is going to focus more on bluffing and bribing as players are going to alternate as the border guard while other players try to sneak soda over the border in the game Soda Smugglers. The next game is called Puma Fiosi, where players are going to be playing some different tricks in order to try and win their way up the ladder of their criminal organization's hierarchy. Except for winning a trick draws too much heat from the police, you're actually going to want to be second place for each trick in order to win that round. And then we have Hot Lead, where players are going to be infiltrating these different criminal organizations as undercover cops. And you're going to want to fit in with that organization until you uncover enough evidence in order to convict them. And this game focuses more on a push-your-luck aspect, and if you push too hard, you might blow your cover, and it could cost you the game. And this giveaway is going to be for the complete standard edition bundle, which comes with all three games. And to enter this giveaway, just leave a comment down below with the hashtag... Crime. And let me know of your favorite TV show that falls into that crime category. For me, it's definitely Breaking Bad. I don't think I could ever rewatch it, it's just too stressful, but it's probably the best show in terms of keeping me guessing what was going to happen next, and just shocking me with unexpected events with how the plot moved forward. And now let's go ahead and draw the winner for last week's giveaway, which was for a pledge for Telmore. And to draw a winner, I use this fancy application here. All these extra names down here are bonus entries from my Patreon subscribers. If you like this sort of content and you want to help out the channel, definitely check that out. I really appreciate it and it also gets you some bonus entries into these giveaways. So let's go ahead and draw the comments and draw a winner. And the winner is... Looks like the application is struggling a little bit with these characters, but congratulations Nicholas Perez. I'll reach out to you and let you know you won yourself a pledge for Tell More. And I did ask viewers to leave a comment of something that they wish they had more of, and a lot of us did say that we wanted more time. And I definitely understand that, it was my response as well. But just remember to take some time for yourself once in a while. We all have a tendency to overwork ourselves, and just working five days a week and having two days off already seems a little bit unbalanced just to begin with. And I did make a lot of unnecessary sacrifices for my work and it's easy to fall into that trap where you feel invincible or even proud about all the extra hours that you're putting in. But eventually I did learn that all those extra hours and sacrifice do come at the cost of your health and the people around you and I really did need to develop that respect for myself and my own time and the things that I wanted to do. And as I grow older, I value my time more and more. I don't know if any of you actually need to hear this, but I hope it helps. It's just a lesson that I've learned and seeing all those comments just reminded me of that phase in my life that I'm still unfortunately living through. Anyway, that's it for this week. Thanks so much for watching. And until next time, keep that shelf cluttered and the table full.